cut off in the midst of the week and make uh, in, in uh, the midst of the week and, and cause sacrifice and, ob and, uh, and oblation to uh, cease. Uh, well, the Messiah did have a three and a half year ministry, and at the end of, he was cut off in the literal midst of a week of a Wednesday. Uh, he was cut off in the midst of a figurative week in the sense of three and a half years. Uh, some have applied it there and said, well, the, the covenant is talking about the new covenant. And uh, he was cut off in the midst of the week. And his death brought sacrifice to an end. Well, it's true that he was cut off in the midst of the week. And it's true that he paid the penalty for sin. But that still leaves you with half of a week left over. And where does that half week come in? Because you got 70 weeks that have to be complete at the time of his return. Now, another way of, of rendering it, uh, you know, just let's look back. Let's, uh, uh, let's read verse 26 and 27 together. After the three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off and be no more. And the people of a prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. But his end shall be with a flood, and upon the end of the war, des unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall make a firm covenant with many for one week. And for half the week, he'll cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. Now, who is the he? Is the he referring back to the Messiah? Well, it talks about the Messiah, but then later on in verse 26, it says, the people of a prince that shall come shall destroy the city. So the last, see, the, the real, the question in interpreting verse 27 is who is the antecedent of he? The Messiah or the prince? They're both mentioned in verse 26, but the prince is the last one mentioned. Now, the Hebrew is vague enough that, that in Hebrew the antecedent doesn't always have to refer. In English it would be pretty clear because in English normally the antecedent refers to the, uh, to the one just mentioned previously. In Hebrew that's not always the case. A lot of times it is, but, but sometimes it's not. Uh, the expression here for, the King James says confirm a covenant. But if you look it up, it is a different expression that is used anywhere else in the Old Testament. Uh, basically, it means to make firm a covenant or to make strong a covenant. Uh, giving perhaps the impression that the covenant was already in existence, but that someone came along to sort of firm it up, to enforce it. Uh, it is a, it's to be done for one week or seven years. And halfway through it, the sacrifice and oblation ceases. He makes the sacrifice and offering to cease. And the abomination that makes desolate. Well, we know from the very end of the book of Daniel, what? That the... Uh, see, if you go back to Daniel 12, uh, in verse 11 it says, From the time that the continual burnt offering shall be taken away and the detestable thing shall, that causes a pall, but set up. There's to be 1,290 days. Now, that's bringing you down to the resurrection. Um, see, the, the other indication, and, and I'll just say it's something that uh, um, we have not tended to focus on this part of it. It's, it's something, it's a topic we've discussed several times uh, in some of our Council of Elders uh, meetings in, in uh, uh, you know, the, the problem, I would say, the biggest problem with applying that, that uh, uh, part of it, if you try to say that the he in verse uh, 27 refers to Christ, Christ did uh, make the new covenant, and he did, his ministry was three and a half years, uh, but the sacrifices didn't cease, and they didn't even cease for the church. The proof of that is you can, uh, they weren't offering sin offerings necessarily, but they were offering burnt offerings. Go back to the book of Acts, uh, where James uh, tells Paul to go in and stand for these men who, are, who have sacrifices. The, the Christians in Jerusalem continued to participate in the temple 
ceremonies right up until the temple, until they fled Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed. Uh, you could say, well, the need for sacrifices was ended at Christ's return, and, and in that sense it was. Uh, he offered one sacrifice for sin forever. But, you know, if you just take the most uh, natural flow of it, the prince, we know that's Titus who came and destroyed the city and the sanctuary. That's a matter of history, 70 A.D. And uh, desolations were determined all the way till the end of the Jewish war. Horrible. Well, that really then becomes a type of the end time, doesn't it? Christ used that, Matthew 24. He shall make, who? He, the, the prince, the Roman emperor, the, Ro the, the beast, uh, the successor of Titus. Uh, he shall make a firm covenant, or, or make firm a covenant, make strong a covenant, some sort of treaty. The word covenant uh, is the same word for treaty, and it's used in a secular and a religious context uh, in, in the Old Testament. For one week, a seven-year treaty. And halfway through, he betrays the, uh, you know, he, he turns things around and he uh, causes the sacrifice and offering to cease. We know from Daniel 12 that that is going to happen, and it is going to happen just over three and a half years before the return of the Messiah. I mean, Daniel 12 is very explicit. Christ talks about the abomination of desolation in an end-time context in Matthew 24. So the advantage that that explanation has is it makes clear where is your week. Your 70th week is the final seven years before Christ returns because when the 70 weeks ends, then all the things that were spoken of in the earlier part of Daniel chapter 9 will have taken place. Uh, Daniel 9, 24. So, uh, at the end of the 70 weeks, uh, finish the transgression, make an end of sin, forgive iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy place or the holy of holies. Uh, so that, those six things will have been accomplished at the end of the 70th week. And so your, your question is, uh, where do you put the split? Uh, do you have 69 weeks plus a half a week, then a gap in the final half week? Or do you have 69 weeks, a gap in the final week? Well, I think the natural reading of it uh, of it would, would tend more to uh, this latter explanation. Uh, though that doesn't take away the fact, I mean, that the, the statements we've made before about the Messiah uh, three and a half year ministry and, and uh, all of that is, is certainly true. I mean, that's, uh, that, that applies. But I think the, the sense, and you know, sometimes uh, you find that, that there, are, there is a dual sense to prophecies uh, that refers to uh, uh, more than one thing. Uh, I'll give you an example in the book of Joel, chapter 2. Peter quotes a part of Joel 2, and he applies it to the events occurring in Acts 2, to the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But you read Joel 2 on into Joel 3. If you notice, when Peter quoted it, he quit in, in, in the midst of a verse. If you read the latter part of Joel 2 on into Joel 3, it's pretty apparent that in the context, the end time is really the primary focus of it. But see, they're both right. Peter, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, well, you know, it's describing what's happening here. It was. And, and uh, so sometimes when things are written in an ambiguous way, uh, there's more than one way to take it. Well, maybe they're both right. But uh, anyway, that, that's something that... Uh, uh, I'll, I gave you a little more focus on, and, and uh, the uh, uh, I, I think that it, it, it flows. You have the 69 weeks, the Messiah comes. After that 69th week, the Messiah is cut off. We're not told how long afterward. Then the people of the prince come. They destroy the city. Well, see, you've got a historic progression. You've got Christ coming. You've got his crucifixion. Then you've got your 40 years down the road when the, when the city is destroyed. Then you come to the next verse, uh, and uh, he will make or make firm a covenant. Well, that, uh, who's the he? You know, Titus uh, did make a seven-year agreement with the Jews historically, which he he uh, broke, uh, and uh, uh, I think in that sense is a type of, of some final. Uh, you know, they may come out with some treaty. Um, that never is really enforced and uh, they're never able to really make it work until the beast power gets involved. 
uh, enters in, gives the Jews permission to do certain things. But anyway, that's uh, chapter 10 moves on that uh, Daniel is now, this is uh, uh, several years later, the third year of Cyrus, and uh, Daniel is fasting and uh, really seeking God, uh, trying to understand uh, more about this vision and uh, trying to understand more of this whole subject. That's the whole uh, uh, point. Now, you find, interestingly, that Daniel is told in Daniel 10, uh, fear not, Daniel, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And then you get a little insight into the spirit realm. You know, I was sent. I'm here because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 20 day, uh, 21 days. And Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I was left over there beside the king of Persia. And now I'm come to make you understand what's going to befall your people in the end of the days, where it's yet a vision for the days. Now, you know, there was struggle going on in the spirit realm. You and I don't fully understand how do angels struggle. Uh, but in some ways, uh, this uh, angel was being uh, interfered with by uh, one who is called the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Michael came, uh, you know, as the chief uh, of the of the angels uh, under uh, under God's authority, and one that has specific uh, uh, responsibility for Israel. Uh, Michael came and uh, dealt with the matter, and this angel was allowed to come on here to Daniel, and uh, so he. T tells Daniel in verse 20, uh, Know that uh, I'm come unto you. Why I'm come unto you? Now I'm going to return to fight with the prince of Persia. And uh, when I go forth, the prince of Greece shall come. So there was, you know, a lot of times what we see going on on the, uh, on the uh, physical level, uh, really there's another battle going on, on, the, on the, in the spirit realm, I think. Uh, at some point in the future, we'll understand that. We've given just a little insight into it here. Uh, so he says, uh, uh, this angel is the one that's speaking here in chapter 11, verse 1. As for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to be a supporter and a stronghold unto him. And now I will declare unto you the truth. So he says, you know, I've been dealing with some of this and, and uh, uh, there are going to yet rise up three kings in Persia. There were three uh, primary kings or, or uh, major rulers. The fourth will be far richer than they all. And when he's racked strong through his riches, he'll stir up against the whole realm of Greece. That's speaking of Xerxes. He's the fourth one. And uh, then later, a mighty king uh, shall stand up, this is the Greek king, and shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, the kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided toward the four winds, not to his posterity. So, we've already looked at that. We have Persia followed by Greece, Alexander dies, and his empire is split. Now, I'm going to pass out something uh, to you at this point. Uh, this prophecy in Daniel 11 is the most detailed prophecy in Scripture uh, in terms of uh, historic, uh, historic detail. And I'm not going to try to go through every name, date, and place uh, but I've given you a verse-by-verse -verse rundown, and you can uh, go through and study that out, uh, because if I try to uh, go through it all verbally, it, it's, uh, it, it will enable you to do that. What we start is a very detailed story of what happened between the Testaments. The... Uh, 
it starts out by talking about the empire split four ways of, of Alexander, but then it very quickly focuses in on two, a king of the south and a king of the north, because there were only two of the four successors of Alexander that played an important part in, in the story of God's people. That was the kingdom of the Seleucids north of Jerusalem and the kingdom of the Ptolemies south of Jerusalem. And so we quickly get to them and we trace through the, the struggle and all of the uh, intrigue and the things going on between the king of the north and the king of the south. And you track it through in uh, chapter 11 and uh, you see uh, that... Uh, let me uh, just show you as we, uh, as, as we go through sort of the break point. Uh, see, verse 31, chapter 11, verse 31. Uh, Arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, shall take away the daily sacrifice, and shall place the abomination that makes desolate. Well, we know about that. We know when that occurred. Uh, because again, we get back to Antiochus, Epiphanes, and, and uh, the events of the abomination. Such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Well, what you find, of course, is some of the Jews collaborated with Ant Antiochus and they uh, betrayed the covenant, and we find there were those, uh, the Maccabees, who were strong, who did exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Uh, they will fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, by spoil many days. And uh, uh, as you get to verse 15, many of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge, to make them white, even to the time of the end, which yet for a time appointed. So beginning here with the days of the Maccabee revolt, in just a few verses, we have summarized the whole history of the people of God for centuries, and we're now down to the time of the end, verse 35. And now we come in verse 36 to a king that will do according to his will, magnify, exalt himself above every god, uh, magnify himself above all, verse 37. Uh, at the time of the end, verse 40, shall the king of the south push at him, the king of the north will come at him like a whirlwind. We're now down to the events of the time of the end and the beast power. So it becomes apparent when you look at chapter 11 is that Antiochus was a type of the final beast. And so there are things we can learn about the events of the end time from looking at the events surrounding Antiochus. You remember when Christ talked about the abomination that makes desolate. He says, the, the one spoken of by Daniel the prophet, this is where Daniel was speaking of it, let him that reads understand. And Christ atta attached it to the end time. So there is an end time fulfillment of what had occurred anciently. Uh, I'll let you go through the, uh, the uh, write-up on uh, chapter 11 to go through the details of the Ptolemies and the Seleucids one by one. Uh, but let's, uh, let's pick up the story with Antiochus. And uh, in verse 21 of Daniel 11. This is where you, uh, you, you I'll leave you to go through the handout to uh, bring you up to that point. In his estate, pre speaking of the predecessor king, shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Now that's what Antiochus did. He was not the uh, normal heir, but he intrigued and he uh, uh, is described here as a vile person. But he came in peaceably and obtained it by flatteries. I think that tells you something about the final beast and how he's going to come to power. I think Antiochus is a type of that final beast. He's a vile person. Uh, he comes in peaceably and obtains it with flatteries. It's interesting, you know, that's exactly how Adolf Hitler came to power. He was a vile person. Uh, you know, they didn't really want to give him the honor of the kingdom. Uh, he came in peaceably, uh, made a lot of promises, uh, you know, flattered certain ones. Uh, he had come out with the largest block in the, uh, uh, in the Reichstag, but not, uh, not a majority. And they wound up, uh, uh, you know, some of these uh, smart guys thought that they could control him, 
uh, and uh, that backfired on them. So uh, uh, he describes the uh, verse 23 after the league made with him to the prince of the covenant would, would undoubtedly historically refer to the high priest uh, and uh, after the league made with him he shall work deceitfully and uh, he'll come and become strong with a small people enter peaceably into the fattest portion of the province uh, which again you can tie in you see even with what we spent a lot of time on in Daniel 9 uh, what, what does he do? Well, uh, after the league, uh, this is uh, obviously a, let me check right here on the Hebrew before I comment on what it was. Uh, yeah, it, it's the term for covenant. Uh, the uh, uh, Ataha Brit, uh, Brit is covenant. Uh, Brit Ish uh, means man of the covenant. Uh, by the way, uh, B R I T. That's that's uh, covenant for. Uh, uh, you know what they call. You know what the name for the United States is in, in Hebrew. If you read an Israeli newspaper, uh, of course they don't say United States. That's an English term. Uh, the term in, in Hebrew is uh, uh, Hartzot Habrit, which means literally translated the land of the covenant. Uh, and that's their name for the United States. So uh, anyway, just sort of uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, he says that, uh, see here in Daniel 11, that uh, he, uh, after the league, after the treaty, the covenant, well, is that referring to the covenant that, that he makes strong, that the prince makes strong? Uh, after the, the, the league or the covenant, uh, he's going to work deceitfully. See, and he comes in, he enters peaceably. You remember Christ said, when you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, know the desolation thereof is near, flee. If those armies come with guns blazing, you don't need somebody to tell you the desolation thereof is near and it's already a little late to flee. I, I think that if you put that together with here in verse 24, he, he enters peaceably. You know, comes in, he's... he's uh, you know, makes excuses. He gets his armies in place. But he's, you know, his, he, he comes in peaceably, but he doesn't stay peaceable. He's working deceitfully. That's why Christ told his disciples, when you see it, don't be gullible and just think, oh, you know, nice man, he's here to help. Uh, you better get out. Know that the desolation thereof is near. They've showed up, and they're, it's, everything's going to break loose. So he enters in peaceably, and uh, he does what his fathers haven't done. Uh, and uh, it, it describes here the, uh, uh, what he does against the king of the south. And uh, it is uh, a very apt description of diplomacy. Verse 27. Both these, heart, these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief. And they shall speak lies at one table. But it shall not prosper. Isn't that, uh, you know, isn't that a good description you know, think about Hitler and Stalin when they made the uh, when they made their pact before World War II. Uh, you, you know, both their in both of their hearts was to do mischief, and they spoke lies at one table. Well, it's not just Hitler and Stalin. I mean, it's any number of times people have sat down at one table, and, and each of them was plotting in his mind to snooker the other one, and they just sat there and looked the other one in the face and smiled. And, you know. You just had a peace conference between uh, uh, the Palestinian leader and the Israeli leader. Uh, probably not a bad description of what was going on. I suspect there were lies spoken at one table. Uh, anyway, the uh, so we, we find that in verse 28, his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant and he'll do exploits. And it describes literally what happened with Antiochus, how he came back down to Egypt. Verse 30, the ships of Kittim, uh, which was the Roman fleet. Uh, Kittim was an ancient name for, for uh, uh, Sicily. Uh, you know, they didn't let him do what he wanted to do in Egypt, so he came back. He returned, had intelligence with them that forsook the Holy Covenant. He entered into intrigue with apostate Jews, uh, polluted the sanctuary, took away the daily sacrifice, placed the abomination. I mean, that's the historical description Antiochus did that. Uh, and, and then you have the revolt. But 
Uh, it, it is at this point you begin to clearly skip on down to the time of the end. And uh, we find in verse 40, at the time of the end, the king of the south will push at him. Uh, undoubtedly, uh, uh, you know, you've got the civilization that was anchored on the south shore of the Mediterranean, the civilization anchored on the north shore. Uh, the king of the south, king of the north, the, the Islamic world uh, that uh, uh, will undoubtedly be the very end time. Uh, some prominent individual will arise over there and push at the king of the north. We don't, what, what does that mean? Is he going to uh, uh, declare an embargo or what, what's he going to do? Well, the result is the king of the north is going to come at him like a whirlwind and a uh, real blitzkrieg. He's going to overflow, enter into the glorious land, verse 41, use that as an excuse to occupy the land of Israel. Many countries will be overthrown. Certain ones will escape. Uh, Egypt will not escape. And uh, so he's going to uh, invade. But, verse 44, tidings out of the east and out of the north will trouble him. You know, at the, at, in the aftermath of that, Tidings out of the east and the north. Well, that's, uh, uh, you know, if you tie it in with the book of Revelation and other things, you find, of course, that the kings of the east, which Revelation says are going to put together an army of 200 million men. Uh, I can't give you a list of all the ones. The Bible gives a list of some. Uh, I think it's very obvious just from the demographics that to put an army of 200 million men together, you've got to have India and China involved because nobody else can put an army of 200 million men. Uh, you know, both of them, they're the only two countries that have over 1 billion population. So uh, uh, they're obviously providing a, a tremendous amount. What happens is they've all been sort of tied together, at least in some sort of uh, economic combine uh, with the beast power. Uh, but, you know, when they see what he does in the Middle East, they begin to get nervous. He uh, hears, he gets word that, you know, they're unhappy. He has the idea that he's going to take them out too uh, and show them who's boss. And uh, uh, as you, at that point, you go back to Revelation and look at the, uh, uh, you know, look at what happens with the trumpet plagues, how Europe strikes uh, Asia and Asia comes back and strikes, uh, uh, strikes Europe. And uh, they're going to be... Uh, and things are going to be, be, begin to unravel. And it's at that time, chapter 12, verse 1, that Michael shall stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of your people. And he, there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone found written in the book. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life, some to shame everlasting contempt so there's the resurrection you know at that time the very time of the end Michael will stand up uh, you see there's been a time of trouble uh, the the great tribulation Christ referred to it Matthew 24 time of trouble such as it never was uh, Jeremiah 30 verse 7 refers to it as well and it, it's at the end of that tribulation that Michael stands up and the people are delivered uh, and the time of the resurrection. Daniel was told, verse 4, shut up the word, seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, interesting, the description of the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. You know, if you look at the 20th century, you find a remarkable thing. At the beginning of the 20th century, most people traveled the way they had always traveled. You know, most of us, uh, uh, you, you, you look back, uh, certainly uh, uh, the generation of our parents or our grandparents, how did they farm? They farmed with draft animals. You know, I, I look back at, uh, uh, you know, first job my father had when he was a teenager back in the early 1920s was driving a, a wagon of mules uh, that was hauling timber to the first oil derricks in, uh, uh, in southern Arkansas. He, uh, 
1922, the smack over field, the first oil in that whole area. Well, they built the derricks out of wood. And how did they transport the timber from the sawmill to the, well, they transported them on a wagon pulled by mules. Now, in just a few years, uh, you know, by the time World War II ended, well, the mules and, the, and, and draft animals were, were uh, becoming a rarity. But you don't have to go back much further, much earlier than World War II. In fact, if you ever see the newsreel footage of World War II, I think it's one of the most remarkable things. I, I, ought to, I need to try to get the footage and, and try to work it into a program sometime because it's one of the most remarkable uh, pictorial fulfillments. The, the opening shot, of course, was Hitler's invasion of Poland. And the newsreel footage made at the time, the Polish cavalry, you know, they were on, they were on horseback. Uh, and you see the, the Polish officers, you know, with their sword telling the troops to charge. Uh, the opening shot of World War II uh, was, you know, the, the uh, men on horses ready to, uh, of course, Hitler's troops weren't on horses. Uh, but... Uh, uh, here you, you open with, with somebody on horseback, and of course you know the final shot of World War II is the mushroom-shaped cloud uh, over, over Nagasaki. I mean, it's a remarkable thing. Six years <coughs> separated a general on a horse from the mushroom-shaped uh, mushroom cloud. Uh, the 20th century in the lifetime of one generation, uh, the automobile, uh, the uh, airplanes, uh, all of these, all, all of these things that uh, that came on. You know, it's uh, Mr. Armstrong's lifetime. Uh, he tells the the, the joke about uh, when he was a little boy. Uh, the first cars had been invented. He'd never seen one, but he'd heard about them. And uh, they were there in their house. He was a little boy, and his father uh, was there to win. And he says, "Here, come quick! A horseless carriage." Well, he, came, he and his sister came running over there looking out the window. What they saw was a carriage pulled by mules. And his father thought that was really funny. You know, they'd run to see a horseless carriage. It was. Uh, it was pulled by a mule, not a horse. Uh, but, you know, in his lifetime, uh, nobody had ever flown an airplane. There were no airplanes. And, and yet, by the end of his life, he was riding in a jet. Uh, you, you know, if you were to chart out a chart 60 inches, 5 feet long, an inch for each century. It'd be the last inch out of that 60 before you got to automobiles, airplanes, many running to and fro. I mean, up until uh, up until the 20th century, if you wanted to go somewhere, you walked, you rode on an animal, or you rode in something pulled by an animal. And uh, by 1969, we'd put a man on the moon. You realize, you know, the Wright brothers, what, what was it, 1903, when they flew the, the first, took off from Kitty Hawk? 66 years. Knowledge will be increased, you know. Television, computers, uh, all of the, the rapid technology. The 20th century was a unique time. A time of the end. Many will run to and fro. Knowledge will be increased. So that is descriptive. Of, of this time period in which we're living and going back, uh, let's say, to uh, around the, uh, the time period of World War II uh, to the time of the 20th century in a, in a, in a remarkable way. Uh, so Daniel wonders how long, verse 6. And uh, he was told, uh, verse 7, time, times, and a half. When he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And uh, I, I heard, but I understood not. And I said, oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he says, go your way, Daniel. The words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. You know, it's interesting. You know, when Mr. Armstrong understood some of these prophecies, you know, it says in, in Psalm 111, last verse, a good understanding of all they that do his commandments. You know, the first thing Mr. Armstrong came to understand was about the Sabbath. He, he, well, actually, the twin subjects of evolution and the Sabbath. Uh, proving the existence of God, the Creator, and understanding about the Sabbath. And it was only after he had started uh, keeping the Sabbath that he began understanding prophecy, a good understanding of all they that do his commandments. See, that was, God began to open up these things, uh, sealed up until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made white, tried. That's just an overall summary of what's happened. You know, people have, have been converted, uh, 
They've gone through trials. The wicked will do wickedly. None of the wicked are going to understand. The wise will understand. See, wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. And uh, so you understand that, that who's really going to understand. It's not going to be uh, the, uh, those who are following their own ways. From the time that the daily sacrifice will be taken away and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there's going to be 1,290 days. Blessed is he that waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But go your way till the end be. You're going to rest and stand in your lot at the end of the days. Now, let me just make a little comment here. Uh, you know, you've got two periods of days that are different. They're 45 days difference, 1,335 and 1,290. Do they start at the same time and end at different times? Or do they end at the same time and start at different times? Well, I think the key is verse... 13. Go your way till the end be. You're going to rest. Daniel's going to die. See, and sleep in the grave. And he will stand in his lot at the end of the days. All these days end at the same time. They end at the return of Christ, the resurrection. So, 1290 days before the resurrection is when the sacrifice is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate set up. Well, Something happens 45 days earlier than that. It doesn't say what that is. It says just blessed is he uh, that waits and comes to the 1,335 days. I, I, I think, and, and, you know, I, it doesn't say, I don't know a definitive answer. I think that it has something to do with God's work and, and perhaps with uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, end of the work as we know it, perhaps a uh, time when uh, God's people uh, leave, uh, you know, those who are going to go to, uh, if we're going to go to a place of safety, uh, then we, we have to get there. Uh, you know, we're told by Christ, if you wait until the armies surround Jerusalem, he says, let them that are in the countries not enter therein. Don't, don't, you know, that's not the time to come to the Middle East. Uh, when you see the army surrounding Jerusalem, that's the time to get out of Jerusalem. But in order for somebody to get out, they've got to get there. Uh, when are they going to come? Well, I think it's probably connected with this. Uh, I'll show you one other thing. You know, we often comment about the time times and a half a time were 1,260 days. If you notice, of course, that's 30 days shorter than this 1290 when the abomination is set up. Uh, what happened, you know, all of these periods, the 1260, the, the, the 1260, the 1290, the 1335, they've started different times, but they all end with the return of Christ. Uh, let me show you something in Daniel chapter, or not in Daniel, in Hosea chapter 5, a couple of, a couple of pages over. Talking about Ephraim and Judah. Hosea 5.5, 5, the pride of Israel testifies to his face, therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity, Judah also shall fall with them. That has never happened in antiquity that Ephraim and Judah fell at the same time. But that is going to happen in the end time. Notice, verse 7, they have dealt treacherously against the Lord. They have begotten strange children. Now shall a month devour them with their portions. Well, the difference between 1,290 days and 1,260 days is a month, isn't it? Uh, I think the setting, you know, based on that tying these verses together is the armies uh, surrounded Jerusalem and the sacrifices are made to stop and in the course of that month, Israel and Judah fall. So that by the end of that month, the tribulation the Great Tribulation has begun. That's why you get 1,260 days. Uh, it becomes the way to, to sort of line all those things up. If you want to chart it out, uh, draw a line for the return of Christ, come back 1,260 days, then come back 1,290, 30 days earlier, then come back 1,335, 45 days earlier. And uh, uh, the 1,290 is the abomination. Uh, the 1,260, see that final three and a half years, is uh, the time of the two witnesses prophesying in Jerusalem, the time of the Great Tribulation. And uh, that 30 days in between, the 1290 and the 1260, is Hosea 5-7. A month shall devour them with their portion. Uh, is the time period 
uh, when the Israelitish nations fall and go into captivity. So, uh, anyway, we've covered a lot in Daniel, and I hope that uh, we haven't answered everything, but uh, hopefully we have uh, given you some things to think about, some things that will be uh, uh, helpful. And uh, with that, we'll be concluded this evening. I have study questions on the book of Hosea, which we will go into next time.